All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and start. I have a ton of content here, so I'm just going to go ahead and start right away. Thank you all for coming. I hope that you can all hear me OK. If not, let me know. Do crazy hand gestures or something. But first of all, my name is Francisco, and I'm a security nerd of all sorts. I currently run the managed services architecture group at a Swiss security company. But uh, before that, I did actual technical stuff. I was an architect, I was a security engineer, a DevOps security engineer. I was a consultant after a very large and public breach at a Middle Eastern energy company uh, in 2013. If you Google those things, you'll figure it out. Uh, and I was also a security analyst. And the security analyst portion of my career was probably when I was the happiest and I really enjoyed my job. You know, it was just fun seeing cool stuff every day. So to give everybody some context, uh, and before we start the talk, uh, some of this probably definitely is classified, so if you have a security clearance, uh, don't feel bad if, I, uh, if you guys choose to step out of the room. So some context around where this came from. In around April of 2017, <laughs> you can stay, but all right. Uh, in about April of 2017, we saw a group called the Shadow Brokers leak quite a few things in what they called their lost in translation leak. This leak included Windows exploits, some uh, notes on a Swift exploit operation against a Middle Eastern uh, Swift organization, and a post-exploitation framework. And a lot of people ended up covering the super cool and sexy exploits that we probably all know about now, which is like Eternal Blue and, and all of those. And they even covered you know, the in-depth technical stuff about the, the double pulsar like in-memory backdoor. But nobody was focusing on what I really wanted to know, which was the bulk of this leak is post-exploitation tools and tradecraft and capabilities. And everybody was just focused on the super sexy Eternal Blue stuff and how it was being weaponized. So I really wanted to, to understand that a bit better. Uh, everybody gets breached and they say it was an APT. Uh, it never really is, so I wanted to see it from the other side. What, what does an APT framework uh, really look like? And finally, I also wanted other researchers to encourage a ton of other researchers to look into this as well. There's honestly a ton of stuff in here, just like gigs of stuff, including DLLs and executables and things that are just crazy awesome, but nobody's digging into it. So I'm not a reverse engineer. I'd love to encourage you guys to really go and look at this, look at the DLLs, look at the executables, as you see it, kind of the capabilities that are built into the framework. And finally, I looked into this because I was uh, getting hounded by my friends about my technical ability as my career was progressing. So, you know, when I started my career, uh, every day sort of looked like this. Uh, and now, as my career has progressed and now I'm a, a manager, uh, it started to actually look like this. Uh, and I started to look like this. I have literally worn, like, underwear to a meeting with a tie and everything. So definitely this has been me. And my inbox started to look like this. And my buddies, some of who are sitting in the audience, would be like, hey, man, how is Excel treating you? Is there a terminal in that or something? So I, you know, I really wanted to start looking into something technical. So before we get started, let me cover some of the agenda and some of the topics that we'll be touching on today. The first is we'll actually be touching on a history, a very brief history, of the frameworks. And I say frameworks because there's actually two post-exploitation frameworks included in that leak. One that's a legacy framework that kind of built Dander Spritz and Dander Spritz itself. Then I'll give again a very brief overview of how the equation group, based on what we see in this leak, actually got to post-exploitation. Uh, the talk is about post-exploitation, but just a very brief intro into how we got to post-exploitation. Then we'll do an intro to Dander Spritz. Uh, I'll define some of the terms, give you some information about how the framework in general works and how it's architected. Uh, we'll get into then the super cool stuff, like all this sort of information that the framework automatically connect, collects when you first connect to a target or a computer. We'll talk about tradecraft. I was actually able to discern quite a bit about the equation group's tradecraft based on the tools and some of the operational notes that were included in the, in the leak. 
We'll talk about persistence, so how the framework actually gains and maintains persistence on a box, and this is super cool. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with uh, some reconnaissance, things like lateral movement, and finally, uh, how they do stealthy data exfiltration. So as I mentioned, there's actually two frameworks included in this leak. The first started being developed in what looks like 2001, and this is called Expanding Pulley. In 2005 is when we actually start seeing the very first mentions of this Dander Spritz framework, which is what we have as of 2013 based on the leak. And then in 2011, the Dander Spritz framework uh, that we'll be looking at today actually went through a pretty major rewrite in, in some of the portions of the code that I'll talk about. So uh, the equation group developers were super helpful in leaving some dates and information uh, in their files and in their scripts. So in these .eps scripts, which are included in this leak, uh, which stands for expanding pulley script .eps, uh, and these are, interestingly enough, some kind of custom scripting language that looks like a mixture of like C sharp and Perl, but it's definitely custom. Uh, it's, it's meant to augment some of the capabilities of this framework. And again, we started seeing this around early 2011, or sorry, 2001. The framework then, expanding pulley, was very basic. It was basically a command prompt and then just a GUI that tells you, hey, these are all the things that you're running on this specific computer. So extremely basic compared to what we have access to uh, in the 2013 leak. In 2005, we actually started seeing the equation group uh, porting some of these capabilities to what are called um, Dander Spritz scripts, so .dss, another custom scripting language. They added some concepts like uh, the ability to import functions from other modules, just made it a bit more modular, a, a little bit better overall. And in 2011 is when they actually ended up rewriting all of these plugins, all of these scripts, everything uh, to Python. I assume because they wanted operators to be able to actually write custom scripts per the operation uh, and kind of run them on the fly. Uh, the framework actually has the capability to drop you into a script editor, test your code, and then run it live on the target. So it's, it's really modular, and I assume the, you know, as the operators were getting up to speed, it was much easier to just be able to whip something quickly up in Python than have to go through and learn this framework and, and things like that. So this is what Dander Spritz looks like today. It's much more advanced than Expanding Pulley was in, in 2001 and even 2005. Uh, and we'll cover some of the capabilities of the framework. Uh, but it, it's pretty robust now, even though it does look like a 2000s hacking movie. All right, so before we get into the meat of the talk, I just wanted to just give everybody a brief overview of how, based on what we see in the leak, the equation group was actually getting to post-exploitation, like how did Dander Spritz actually run on a computer? The way that it works is Fuzzbunch, which was leaked and is a Metasploit-like framework that's included in this leak. It literally allows the operator to say, hey, here's the computer, what's it vulnerable to, what's its architecture, what's its operating system? And the framework will actually recommend an exploit that you should use uh, based on a bunch of information that it's gathered about the computer via like SMB or, or other capabilities. Then the operator would actually use that exploit. Uh, most commonly on endpoints, it's Eternal Blue, so the, the one that we, we've all heard about and is the new MS-08067 for sure. Um, they would then use this exploit to install an in-memory backdoor, and this is Double Pulsar. Double Pulsar is an in-memory backdoor, has quite a few capabilities, including like running shellcode or DLLs or actually an executable. And then pedal cheap was then loaded, which is the actual implant. So this is the piece of code that's responsible for communicating to the command and control server and running commands on the infected computer. Uh, pedal cheap is, is that piece of communication. And finally, Dander Spritz is really just the command and control server. They call it something different, we'll cover that. But that's the, <laughs> uh, that is exactly what Dander Spritz is. So other things that Dander Spritz is, is uh, actually pretty fucking cool. Like honestly, this framework is impressive, even for 2013. Like every time that I was looking at something, I was like, oh yeah, 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 everybody knows how to do this now. And then I'd be like, wait, wait, no, no. These were their capabilities in 2013, and they're still actively functional and very stealthy. Uh, Dander Spritz is actually a fully functional post-exploitation framework. 
And what I mean by that is it can get you from first getting on the box to getting persistence to moving laterally within the organization to identifying files that you need to pull and then stealthily exfiltrating them all in one built into this framework in a way that's extremely difficult to detect. The core of the framework, so the actual dander spritz GUI and like what it calls is written in Java, but uh, it's also extremely modular. And the way that they built this modularization is by building what they call plugins. And plugins are the actual commands or functions that you run. And they're really just written in Python. So there's a plugin called password dump, and it's written in Python. It may load a DLL into memory on the host, but really the functionality, the core functionality is written in Python. So it was really easy for people and operators to write their own plugins or, or their own features. Uh, and I was actually able to create a plugin fairly easily by just you know, creating some uh, Python code and some XML files, and it was fairly easy to, to make this modular and add functionality. One thing that's really key to note is that this entire framework has truly been designed for stealth because there's a lot of things that prevent dumb operators from making mistakes and getting caught. And we'll talk about that. There's ways that the framework can literally say, no, sorry, based on, on this computer, you cannot run this command because you will probably be identified. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Before we get into the deep of it, uh, let's talk a little bit about the terms or, or some of the things that Danderspritz uses. Uh, the first is op or operation. And this is a concept that essentially says, hey, this is an operation against a specific organization. So that Middle Eastern Swift organization, it was an operation against that, that specific target. A target to this framework is the actual computer that you're attacking. So the computer that Danderspritz is, is running code on. LP stands for listening post or CNC. Danderspritz is the listening post, is the actual CNC system. Plugin, as I covered, is just a functionality included in the framework. A command, when we see command, it's actually something being run live on the target. A PSP, and we'll see this quite a bit, stands for personal protection product. So this is AV or some kind of security product that may be installed on the target. Uh, and finally, uh, there's, there's these things called safety handlers, which are the things that, again, prevent the operators from, from fucking this up. All right, so, sorry? Uh, that's true. Um, so what an operation is, an operation is really a repository for Daniel Spritz data of everything it collects from a target, and I mean everything. Files you've downloaded, information about the target, what's installed on the, on the target, things like that. Each operation, by default, you are forced to create a public-private key pair for all the traffic that's happening through that command and control channel. So one operation and another operation will never have the same uh, kind of you know, encryption keys for stealth reasons. Dander Spritz will actually automatically correlate data from one target in an operation to another to aid the operator in maybe seeing some stuff that we'll cover in a bit. Additionally, safety handlers, so these things that prevent the operator from really messing it up or even dander spritz from doing something dumb are, are registered per op or can be. So if you say, hey, this computer has something that I probably shouldn't use or I shouldn't run this command, you can say, hey, don't let me do this on any target in this operation. Ops, interestingly enough, can actually also be replayed. So dander spritz literally collects every command that you've ever run and the results and you can replay those for what I assume are training purposes. So when the equation group gets a new operator, I'm sure they can just replay a very successful operation and say, this is what you wanna do, don't fuck it up. Uh, and then, if you format your operational notes, which is what's included in this leak, and it's just a text file, in a specific format, Dander Spritz also has a tool to create text summaries that I'm sure you can deliver in kind of a debriefing that says, here are all the tools I used on the target, here are the, here's what worked, here's how I was able to exfiltrate data. So it's very clear that this tool is very complete. So when we, sorry, I'll just cover questions after if you don't mind, sorry. Uh, so in the framework, there's this tool called survey, and survey is responsible for collecting a ton of information from targets when Dander Spritz first connects to it. And by a ton, I mean it collects operating system information, network information, it collects mounted drives, current running processes, 
It actually collects drivers that are uh, loaded and, and available on disk. It'll list all installed software and software keys for some reason. Uh, it'll uh, inform the operator about any personal protection products or AV systems on there. It'll tell you about malware or other things that may have gained persistence on the machine. So it'll do those checks for you. It'll load the uh, security auditing config and logging config and tell you about it. It'll check for scheduled tasks, recently modified files, and recent USB devices that have been plugged in. And then it'll dump passwords for you if it thinks it's safe to do so. We'll talk about that in a sec. So there's a lot of information that's literally collected when you first connect to a target. Uh, as a researcher, this was actually incredibly frustrating because it'd be like 10 minutes of waiting for the Dandersprit's shell to actually pop up after you connected to a computer. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the tradecraft. And I was actually able to determine tradecraft uh, of the equation group based on the tools and, and functionalities of the framework, but also on the operational notes that were included in the leak. So again, there were operational notes of an operator using this framework against the live target that were included in there that were really helpful from a determining tradecraft perspective. The very first thing that I want to talk about is uh, this tool appropriately named Territorial Dispute. And Territorial Dispute is run when you're doing that survey to determine if any other adversarial nation state may actually be connected to that target now or could have been connected in the past. Uh, and the way that they do that is there's this signatures file, sigs.py file, uh, that's literally responsible, and it's just a ton of signatures that says, oh, hey, you know, here's one persistence method that this specific, uh, you know, nation state uses, or other things like that. So it's very clear that they want to make sure that the operator is not in a hostile environment where another target or another adversarial nation state may also be collecting information. Um, additionally, Dander Spritz, in theory, is a post-exploitation framework, but it has a full suite of forensics logs, or forensics tools, built into the framework. Uh, there's this tool called Greater Doctor, uh, which will literally tell you if threads have been injected into memory by looking in disk and like saying, oh, hey, this, is loaded, this module is loaded in memory, but it's not on disk. This seems super weird. Uh, it can actually scan full PE files uh, and, and processes and, and things like that. Uh, it can, you can feed it a PE file and it'll say, hey, here's the header that's running in memory, here's what's on disk, something is wrong. Uh, same thing about drivers and like all sorts of files. So really meant to allow the operator to collect information. And finally, you can actually grab a full memory dump from the machine to process it later. I assume the functionality of this tool is built so that if an operator comes across a potential adversarial nation state where a signature has not been built for that yet for territorial dispute, they can actually create that. Uh, and the framework also has capabilities like Gangster Thief. I love these code names, by the way. Uh, that will actually bypass Windows and read the raw master file table for analysis. So if you think there's a rootkit on the machine that's looking at weird stuff or preventing you from accessing files that you want, screw that. Just use Gangster Thief. Look at the actual raw files. Cool. So during the first connection of this operator connecting to this computer, Dander Spritz will actually uh, load a database of all known good drivers, uh, processes and all sorts of information and automatically highlight suspicious things running on the box for the operator that says, hey, uh, this driver or this thing, uh, we've never seen it before or we know for a fact that it's uh, a tool from an adversarial nation state or, hey, this driver seems to dump memory based on what we can tell. So in the, in the framework, in the leak, there's actually a full database of like every driver, its hash, uh, metadata about it, uh, paths and file names, so that they can compare based on known good information. Additionally, as I've mentioned, if you're connecting to another target within the same operation, the framework can actually identify the fact that, hey, this driver or service or process or thing is actually also on other devices or other targets within the operation and automatically alert the operator to that. And, as I mentioned, uh, it gets persistence checks. So I replaced a uh, Winstock Helper DLL in, in the registry and, and on the disk uh, just to see what it would do, and it immediately identified that and highlighted it and said, hey, uh, this is possible persistence. Like, someone modified this DLL. It's not what we know it should be. So it's, it's very clear that they've, 
taken a lot of time to make sure, hey, is this a clean Windows install? Is anybody else on it? Uh, and if not, get us some information so we can build new signatures. So let's take a bit of time to talk about how this framework literally automatically bypasses AV and logging for the operator. The first is this concept of personal protection product checks or PSP checks, where as the operator connects to the machine, uh, the framework will actually query a database of known uh, potential PSPs or AV systems, say, hey, this is the AV system that's installed in this computer, uh, and we've pulled a bunch of information for you from this specific uh, AV system to tell you, like, hey, when was it last updated? Is this feature or this other feature enabled? And the equation group has actually taken quite a bit of time to write these uh, description scripts for almost every major antivirus product that existed in 2013. So again, this is a leak from 2013, uh, but I can tell you that the framework's effective against most AV products of, uh, of this year. So while they connect to the computer, what they actually do, like I mentioned, is query the registry and a few other locations to say, this is the version of the product that's installed. These are the features that are enabled. Some of these scripts can actually parse uh, encrypted INI files for specific AV vendors and tell the operator like, hey, here's the server that it's connecting to from an AV perspective. And based on what we see in the leak and, and in the framework, it's very clear that the equation group has an entire team uh, dedicated to testing their tools against AV vendors and updating the framework or the tools or the safety handlers as things are occurring. Other things that are, are cool and interesting is that uh, by default, the framework will actually provide operators a visual guide of, hey, here are all the processes that are running. Uh, the ones that you see in green are actually known, trusted uh, processes from Microsoft Windows. In red are McAfee in this case, and it can also uh, show you processes that it thinks are suspicious. So let's talk a little bit about the capabilities that this framework has in terms of preventing detection. And the way it does that is by registering what are called safety handlers. And, and safety handlers are meant to prevent the operator or automated tools built into this framework from performing certain actions that may cause detection. Uh, and there's actually a ton of different safety handlers built into this framework. I'll just cover the most common that I saw while I was using this against a few. Uh, audit. So based on the audit configuration, it can actually prevent the operator from doing certain things that may be logged on the system. Uh, registry additions or queries. So, hey, don't write to this registry key or don't write to the registry at all because we know that something would trip. Uh, the same thing with process injection or memory. We'll talk about memory a bit uh, in a bit more. Uh, network traffic. So it can throttle network traffic. Uh, prevent dropping of executables. It can prevent DLL loads, even if, if the security tool is advanced enough to detect that. So again, they've just taken a lot of time to prevent detection. And it can do way more. What we see here is the actual configuration file written in, in XML that tells Danderspritz, hey, when you see McAfee installed, if this feature is enabled, prevent the operator from writing to specific keys in the registry. So here you see I connected to a target, it identified McAfee was enabled, and it automatically told me, hey, we added this safety handler, this means this process will not work. It's also very clear that as the equation group was writing their plugins or scripts, uh, there was some kind of operational security objective that told them, every time you run a script, run a safety check function that says, is this safety handler enabled? If yes, don't do that, because it would be dumb. So that's again, not just preventing the operator from doing dumb things, but also preventing automated tools that are inherently available in the system from actually uh, performing options, like uh, no inject. So here, it will not let you run password dump if it de determines that it can, something can detect injection into like LSAS or something. Uh, it can also prevent operators from doing really, really dumb things. So here, I used a tool built automatically into Danderspritz and said, hey, actually, you know what? Why don't you just enable all audit logging uh, for the host? And it immediately was like, no, you idiot. I will not let that happen. So even though that there was no specific safety handler written because of 
uh, an operational constraint, it literally just will not let me do dumb things like enabling all auditing. And the same thing, there's this tool called uh, quit and delete. And it will actually harass you if you do something stupid. Like I tried to get off this computer. Perfect, I'll drink this terrible V8. Which one? Oh, God, no. Uh, smear it off ice, please. Thank you. Um, it's hot. <laughs> um, so, sorry. <laughs> so uh, in this quit and delete tool, what it'll actually do is it will actually delete. I'm not drinking all of it. Ah. Oh, man, that is awful hot. <laughs> Fuck. Um, all right, so um, quit and delete actually cleans up for the operator automatically. It'll remove potential persistence that has been gained on the machine and do all sorts of other things. But if you happen to be running a command in the background in Danderspritz that's not like persistent but in memory or something, it'll actually tell you, hey, you idiot, stop that before you disconnect from this computer and delete everything. So again, the framework is built to prevent detection. One of my favorite functions of this tool is uh, actually the fact that they've taken a lot of time to ensure that even machines that have uh, logging enabled or auditing enabled uh, are bypassed. By default, the tool will do something called auditing dorking, or dorking auditing. And what it'll do is it'll actually load a DLL into memory that catches all the calls that Microsoft is uh, hitting to the, hey, write to the event log API. It'll tell Microsoft, yup, I wrote that, and then it'll just drop the event on the floor. So Microsoft thinks all of these things are being written to the event log. We think we're capturing all these awesome logs, uh, but the equation group is like, fuck you. Uh, if for some reason, like you cannot inject a DLL into memory, you can't actually run this audit dorking script It'll, it'll give you a separate option, which is, hey, how about I just monitor the event log and then automatically highlight any events that I think were written because you did something. So here you can see that an audit log was written because I ran some command and it automatically highlighted it for me. Well, that's cool and all, but what can I do about that? Actually, there's a tool built into this framework that will delete the log from the event log by default, and I have not found any security tool as of today, sorry vendors, that can detect me deleting event logs. So I really recommend that people start digging into this specific feature and reversing it. All right, so let's talk about nation state hacking 101, or how not to be an idiot and get caught. The first is, you probably don't wanna slow them down to machines so much that the user gets suspicious, right? Like, hey, my computer's acting slow. IT, can you look at that? You wanna prevent that. Then you probably don't wanna send out a ton of network traffic, even if it's encrypted, because good blue teams are gonna be looking for potential anomalies in network traffic or like large uploads of like, I don't know, 10 terabytes of data or 143 million social security numbers or something like that. Um, you also wanna say, hey, since I was last connected to this computer, uh, have things changed? Like, did someone get suspicious and like turn on extra auditing or install other features of a security product? You also really, really want to try not to actually drop executables on disk, right? Like that makes it super easy uh, for forensicators to actually get data. But if you do drop an executable on disk, you always want to make sure they look legitimate and look like either Microsoft executables or executables from other vendors. And if you do that, make sure that the file times are legitimate, right? So an executable in system 32 with yesterday's file time is a little suspicious. Um, you also wanna encrypt everything. And by this, I don't mean just the actual um, network traffic that's leaving the box from a CNC perspective. If the tool, as an example, captures key logs on the machine or uh, just does key logging, it'll encrypt that file with a unique key so that you cannot decrypt it or you don't know what the hell it is. And finally, you as an operator wanna stay on target for as little as possible, right? Give them as little time as possible to detect you on that computer or within that organization. So let's talk a little bit about how Dander Spritz actually 
makes it incredibly easy for operators to follow all of those tradecraft or uh, hacking 101 uh, categories automatically. The first is the safety, uh, the, the safety handler for memory. So when you connect to a machine, it'll kind of profile the machine and say, hey, this machine by default runs at a memory load of X. I'm going to say, don't go above this memory load because it may, you know, concern the operator and they'll think it's slow. So if the safety handler is enabled, it'll actually automatically prevent commands from running and kind of put them on a waiting period until the memory load has dropped enough or the framework doesn't believe that the user is actively using the computer so that the, the command can be safely ran. That's, that's one way. Another way is being careful about network traffic. Built into this tool, there's a command called throttle, which will let the operator automatically throttle all network traffic that's leaving the host from a CNC perspective. So I'm talking about, hey, if you run a command that gets a bunch of data from a, a disk, it'll throttle that very slowly over to you. And the same thing if you happen to like run a uh, recursive get on a bunch of files, it'll, it'll do that as well. The framework is actually built to ensure that operators are very, very, very aware of how much traffic their activities are generating, uh, how much is sent and received, and finally, how long they're on the target. So here you can see that they're constantly being presented with this information. And if we look at the operational notes from that operation, we can see that even the operators seem to be trained to say, hey, this was the memory load. I didn't audit dorking. Uh, I downloaded things that were about 20 megabytes, and then this is the exact time that I was off the computer. So again, a lot of operational security that's kind of automatically built into the tool. Finally, uh, the tool, like I said, will also automatically identify things that have changed. So I connected to a target. I told, it automatically said, oh, hey, you have Microsoft uh, Defender installed. I installed McAfee on it. The next time I connected, uh, the, the Dander Spritz automatically said, whoa, 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 whoa. Something happened. McAfee was installed in this computer for some reason. And once it did that, it also dumped all the settings from McAfee automatically. Same thing from auditing. So if the actual organization turned on additional auditing capabilities, Dander Spritz will automatically tell the operator that. Maybe these guys are getting suspicious. Don't be an idiot. As we mentioned previously, uh, any executable that's dropped, uh, literally every executable here is incredibly well crafted from a metadata perspective to make sure that it is not detected. You have the option to rename executables uh, in the framework, and if you do, it'll actually change the internal name before it's dropped. So it's very clear that they're making sure that if you drop an executable, uh, it does not look fake. And finally, the framework will automatically match file times. So as it's writing an executable for a specific command, there's a very handy command called match file types, which will search for known good Windows executables in that directory and just steal the file times from that to match it. So again, just making sure that for uh, forensic operators, this is really hard. An example of this tradecraft is me actually installing this key logging function on a machine. What we see first is that uh, Dander Spritz says, hey, I'm going to write this specific executable as this file name. And before this, it prompted me for the file name or suggested one by default. It will then run a command that says, run this executable, install the, install the tool, and then immediately delete it. So again, the goal is don't have this thing on disk. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about how this framework can actually establish persistence. The first is pedal cheap. We talked about pedal cheap a bit ago, that pedal cheap is the actual implant, the piece of code that's responsible for communicating with the command and control server and also delivering commands to the target. Uh, pedal cheap, using a tool built into Dander Spritz, can be installed persistently. But first, it needs to be configured. And when you as the operator are configuring uh, pedal cheap, you have several options. You can tell it to listen. You can tell it to listen at specific times. Uh, you can even tell it to listen after you've port knocked, which was hilarious to me because I haven't seen that in years. But port knocking is actually built into this tool if you need it. Uh, it can also call back if necessary, uh, again at specific times, and it also works with a proxy. 
And the tool will auto collect some information about the environment to tell you if there's a proxy enabled. And then you can use the username and password that was gathered during the recon phase because it automatically dumps passwords. So there you have it. And here's some additional options that the, the tool has when you're actually installing it. Again, it's extremely configurable from an operator perspective. So based on the operation or the target, you can configure almost everything about how Pedal Cheap works and how you communicate with it. Talking about Pedal Cheap and its potential persistence options, there's several actually built into the tool. The first is AppCompat. So most of us in 2017 are very familiar with AppCompat and how it works and how it can actually be used for persistence. But if you select one, uh, it'll actually just write to the AppCompat database and tell it, hey, load this DLL. You're good to go. Uh, the same thing with Winsock Helper. So the second option is Winsock Helper. Uh, you can install a Winsock Helper fake DLL, change the Winsock Helper registry key, and you have persistence when the machine reboots. And then finally, finally, there's also another tool built into this called Killsuit, which is a separate way to get persistence. Killsuit is extremely interesting to me because, first of all, it's modular. So Killsuit can get persistence, but it's extremely modular in the way that it can do that, what it can load uh, from a persistence perspective. As an example, uh, Killsuit also has a bunch of different plugins. And all of these tools that may need persistence on the box, like, I don't know, a keylogger or something like a traffic capture tool, can actually say, oh, hey, I see that you already installed Killsuit. Do you want me to just register to Killsuit and say, hey, just load me when, uh, when you're loading things that are persistent on the box? And finally, once again, if there's anything stored on disk, which for persistence there is, uh, always encrypted with a unique key per target. And that key is stored on the operator's hard drive on Danner Spritz. But again, it's completely unique per target. So one of the persistence methods that we covered actually writes a binary blob to the uh, registry. And in this case, again, it's fully compressed and encrypted. So even if you, as a forensic person, happen to run across this DLL or see something suspicious, you would have no idea what it does. It's just some binary blob on disk. Uh, luckily, the framework comes with this super helpful tool called uh, Kisu Survey or Key, uh, Killsuit Survey, which will actually just automatically tell you all the different ways that persistence are supported by Killsuit. The first persistence method, which doesn't really work nowadays, is a driver. So you can actually, you know, drop a driver into the uh, on the box and say, hey, load this when you're starting. Uh, while in my specific screenshot it looks like it's compatible, it's because I've, I've explicitly disabled uh, driver signing policies, but almost every computer nowadays are, are, you know, looking for driver signatures before they load a driver. Another one is called SOTI or Solar Time, which we'll cover in a bit. It's a really interesting persistence method. And the last, it's called Just Visiting, which is a persistence method that I haven't really been able to find a whole lot about. All I know is that it doesn't really work on Windows 7. It only works on Windows XP, so I wasn't super interested in digging into it. The one that I really was interested in was solar time because it's still a potentially functional uh, persistence method, right? We can't install drivers, just visiting, have no idea what it does, but it doesn't work on above XP. But solar time works, and it works pretty well. So what does solar time do? It actually automatically modifies the MBR to load a, uh, some code before Windows boots. It's really interesting. In the solar time files for Killsuit, there's actual legitimate MBR uh, hashes for almost every MBR that you could potentially come across. So it'll take the first 8,000 bytes of disk, hash them, and compare them against known good hashes before it even tells you, hey, I can modify the MBR. If for some reason the MBR has been modified previously, it won't let you install this tool and actually tell you to maybe look at territorial dispute. So again, maybe someone else already fucked this box. Um, What's interesting is that actual, the containers for the kernel drivers that are loaded by this MBR modification are written into uh, true type font files. So legitimate files are sort of carved out and then in the end of the file, they inject this huge kernel driver and then encrypt it. So that the MBR is modified to say, hey, go fetch this true type font file on the disk, decrypt it, and then load it into memory before you load Windows. Interestingly enough, 
The tool automatically checks for things like BitLocker. So if BitLocker is enabled, you're not going to be able to modify the MBR. And the same thing with uh, EFI. So, you know, maybe today, difficult to get, but I, I guess we'll see. As I mentioned, the tool actually comes with quite a few different uh, functionalities, and one of them is reconnaissance. Uh, reconnaissance is one of the best things about this tool because it does a shitload of it for you automatically. The first example of that is this tool called Overseer. And Overseer will actually automatically capture a bunch of information from the system if you run it. It's not run by default like that survey thing that we covered, but it's something that the operator actually has to launch. And what happens is Overseer will actually first pull all browser data, and this includes IE and Chrome and Firefox, and it even has tools to like browse the SQL files that some of these browsers use. Uh, it can actually pull things like recently played media. I don't know why. Uh, it can look at USB devices that have been plugged in previously or are currently plugged in. Uh, recently run commands, so I don't know. Uh, DNS cache, so it'll dump the full DNS cache, the same thing with ARP. Um, it'll look for recent RDP sessions, something really useful, right? RDP session hijacking. Is this person an administrator that's RDPing to different boxes like domain controllers or file servers or what have you? Then it'll start looking for recently accessed files, uh, PuTTY or WinSCP credentials that may be saved on the box. Remember, it already did password dump, so you have the password from the user. You just maybe want putty credentials. Uh, it'll actually ask you if you want to take periodic screenshots so you know what's on the computer. Uh, it'll look for shares that are mounted or have been mounted previously. It'll actually pull PCAPs if you happen to have installed the traffic capturing tool before. And it'll pull keylogger data. Something that I found interesting is this uh, very appropriately named uh, Simon Tatham uh, script that's built into this overseer tool. Uh, Simon Tatham is actually the developer of PuTTY, so I guess the equation group uh, really just ran out of names or code names for their tools. But uh, what this tool does is it'll actually look for PuTTY installations and WinSCP installations, and if the user happened to have saved their credentials using the default methods, which to be fair, WinSCP and PuTTY do say are insecure, uh, it'll actually decrypt the INI file and give you the password and username and everything raw. So here you can see is that I was able to do that. Uh, the next thing is, by default, the tool will check if the box that you're on is a SQL server and tell you all the SQL instances that are running on the box. Here, uh, you can see that whatever box I'm on happens to be an EPO server, so a McAfee EPO server, uh, which will be interesting here in a bit. Uh, and then, if it is a SQL server, it'll give you a bunch of ways to kind of understand the SQL database layout and then actually potentially exfiltrate data. So you can like list the databases, you can view schemas, you can even say, hey, give me the top 10 rows of every table so I know kind of what it looks like. Uh, and then there's these built-in default query plans, which I'll show you some later because it really gives us some interesting insight into uh, what the equation group is looking at. And then, you know, there's obviously the default kind of like net command uh, recon that you do, like, hey, go pull Active Directory information about users or, or things like that. In addition, uh, they built this super nice tool, which is just kind of a visual net map, similar to what you see in tools like Cobalt Strike, where it says, hey, here are all the hosts in this Active Directory domain that we can talk to. Uh, here are the IP addresses, operating system versions, and uh, software that is running on the machines. So kind of automatically is building all of this for you. Interestingly enough, on the network recon side, they also have this tool called ScanSweep, which is like a really deliberately written uh, end map. What it does is it'll actually slowly trickle scan a bunch of IPs. It'll only let you do 24 slash 24 by default, I assume because it doesn't want you crossing a firewall that may be inspecting this traffic in more depth. But it'll actually scan everything non-sequentially. So if you have an IDS that's looking for sequential scanning of IP addresses or ports, it won't do that. It takes forever to do, but it'll give you a full network map of everything that's running automatically in a way that's not really detectable by the IPSs and IDSs that I've tried this against. All right, so let's talk about some interesting things that the equation group has done in going after the tools that system administrators would want enabled on their computers or even the tools that we as security people, as 
potentially blue team guys uh, would want installed on every computer. The first is uh, WMI. So we know that WMI abuse is pretty rampant now, but again, 2013, there's a full tools, like a, a suite of tools called Empty Keg that's all about WMI abuse. Like, hey, go pull remote processes from this machine if WMI is enabled. Like, go remotely execute commands, modify the registry, all of this stuff. Empty Keg lets you do all of this WMI abuse stuff. Then there are tools then there are tools like uh, canned SQL query plans. So things like, hey, do you want to look at things that are on a Kaspersky or WSUS or other things? Like, it'll actually automatically pull a list of every machine that's ever talked to WSUS and give you a CSV that gives you IP addresses and host names and operating system versions and patches. That's super useful for an attacker. And then the same thing with EPO. They actually specifically wrote a tool that's meant to query the EPO database, which again, as a security guy, you probably want EPO on every one of your boxes. Well, the equation group does too, because they can query literally every machine that's connected to the EPO server, and if they happen to click this really fancy advanced tab, they can actually say, hey, for this machine, turn this feature off or do whatever. And this is all done in the SQL database, so when I did this and then I logged into the EPO UI, there was no trace of it. They had no idea. All right, so wrapping up fairly quickly, uh, let's talk about lateral movement. They have a lot of interesting ways. The first is like, hey, use the credential that you gathered from the recon phase, mount an admin share on the box, and push a configured, like, pedal cheap executable. Then you can schedule a task to run the executable, and you get a callback. And you may think, no way, this is super loud. The equation group would never do that. All over the operational notes, from that operation against the target in the Middle East, they did this to move laterally everywhere in the system. So it's very clear that they're confident in their methods and that they're not gonna get caught. I'll skip some of this, unfortunately, because I'm running low on time, sorry. Uh, but there's also a stealthy way to get persistence on the box, which was the sexier way for me. There's this uh, packet redirect command that's built into the tool, which will actually drop a kernel driver that bypasses the Windows TCP IP stack and injects raw packets as necessary. So you're literally packet, like you're redirecting packets, you're using this box as a proxy in a way that bypasses the Windows TCP IP stack. So once you've configured that box to be your proxy, you've simply configured Fuzzbunch, and you say, hey, Fuzzbunch, use this proxy. Literally as easy as that. And then with Fuzzbunch, you can do the same thing. You can say, hey, what's this other computer that I'm interested in vulnerable to? Cool, let's exploit it. Cool, let's use double pulsar to load pedal cheap. And then you prop it. So a lot of really interesting capabilities here. To wrap up, some of the data gathering and, and things like that. So the framework, as we know, comes with drivers uh, for like MS SQL. But actually, in the framework, if you say, hey, this person has Oracle, it'll load Oracle drivers for, to interact with an Oracle device on the target in memory by default. Same thing with SQLite, MS SQL, every database that you could think of. SharePoint also, there are tools built in to automatically identify interesting documents on SharePoint and then pull them recursively really slowly. So if your organization uses SharePoint, any user has ever connected to SharePoint using their browser, I assume, uh, the equation group will know that and start pulling that data. Also, of course, we want a nice GUI to browse our files, uh, to also search for them if we want, or specific content. There's also a tool called Doc Survey that will automatically uh, survey the machine for interesting documents, and you can choose what to search for like office documents, or architectural drawings, or things like that. So depending on what the operation is against, you want to identify those files. And once you identify those files, uh, you again want to be able to pull them very slowly. So guys, today we talked a little bit about how Dander Spritz uh, is actually loaded on the computer and why it's so damn cool. We looked at Tradecraft, which is really interesting to me because the, the tool is built to facilitate a lot of that. Uh, we looked at persistence, uh, and I really recommend that you look at Killsuit. It's a really interesting uh, tool that uh, has a lot of capabilities and is very modular. I actually saw them pulling stuff out like 
MOF files, so like WMI abuse, like what we saw in Stuxnet, for some reason they removed that from the tool. I don't know why, but uh, you can see that they've either added or, or removed features from this kill suit framework. Then we looked at recon and data expo capabilities. Thanks guys for attending, really appreciate it. You can actually go to dandespritz.com. Yes, I own that domain, I'm super happy about it. Uh, and download a copy of this presentation. I've actually also been documenting a lot of the capabilities of this framework and how it works, all available on dandespritz.com. I'm going to ask again, uh, please researchers look into this more. There's a ton more that I just couldn't cover in this framework and the capabilities. Please look into it, help out on the Dandrespritz doc repository and uh, I'll be available kind of on the side for questions. Thanks guys, appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>